Hello and welcome to Fix More, Waste Less, where I try to fix broken electronics and keep them out of the landfill. Today I have two PlayStation 2 power supplies. These are for the original fat version of the PS2, not for the redesigned Slim, which had its power supply as an external brick. Now one of these I took off of PlayStation 2 that had no power. If you want to see how I solved that problem, please check out the video linked in the corner. But today I'm going to see if I can figure out why this power supply doesn't work. To help me in that endeavor, I have the second power supply that I removed from a working PS2. Amazingly, the two power supplies are the exact same, same layout, same part number even. It's amazing because the fat PS2 went through many different internal design changes and that often included different designs for the power supply. So the fact that I happen to have two that are the same is a little bit of a miracle. Uh, the bigger miracle will be if I can figure out what's wrong with this without hurting myself. Now I do want to reiterate that messing with power supplies like this can be dangerous. They can be dangerous if you know what you're doing and especially dangerous if you don't. The power coming into supply at the connection is coming straight out of the wall. That's 120 volts here in the US. It doesn't get down to a somewhat safer range until later in the circuit so if you start poking around while this thing's plugged in you could cross something that shouldn't and create a problem. And even when it's off, these capacitors, especially the big capacitor here, that's rated at 220 volts on my board, can store that charge for several minutes after being disconnected from power. So don't think you can just flip off the switch and the board's dead because that's not how it works. So please proceed at your own risk. But with the safety warning out of the way, let's see if we can fix this power supply. First, I want to do a bit of an overview of this board and how it works. Remember, almost all power supplies are built different, even for the same product, so the power supply you pull from your PS2 might very well be completely different than this one. Different layout, different board design, different components all over. It might even have a different output voltage to power the PS2 than this one. I don't know, just don't take what you see here as being accurate for the power supply you have. So to start on this board, the power comes in here, this connector, this black piece is what's attached to the back of the PS2 and connected to the wall through a cord. It turns on and off with this switch. The power coming in through here is still at 120 volts. So uh, then the power goes through this fuse, through these capacitors and inductors, through these rectifying diodes, which turn the AC coming in to DC still at a way higher voltage than the PS2 needs to operate and a voltage that would fry the whole board if it managed to get to the motherboard. So from there it goes into this big capacitor. Like I said, it's rated at 220 volts. You want to be careful when messing with this when powered on. This capacitor holds a lot of charge coming into the first part of the circuit. So you certainly don't want to accidentally touch these two leads on the bottom or short them out. That would create a big discharge, sparks. It could seriously injure or kill. So you really shouldn't be holding this when you have it plugged in and power coming in because even though there's no power coming out of the supply, at least in mine, there is power coming in and it's going somewhere through the supply before it dissipates. And I don't yet know where that path ends, so I don't yet know where it's safe. It's best to assume none of it's safe. Let's insert my multimeter leads into the plastic connector to see if we have any power. This connector is what connects the power supply to the PS2 motherboard. And you can see here that I'm getting about 12 volts out when the switch is on on the working board and I get zero volts on the faulty board, hence the power issue. The PS2 is not getting any power so you can expect it to work. Now I've already gone through and tested a lot of places on the board trying to troubleshoot the issue and a common issue I can show you is the fuse. These PS2 power supplies have a fuse early on in the circuit that passes the current coming in from the wall. You probably want this to be one of the first places you look for faults because a blown fuse is going to cut off power to the rest of the board. Now in full disclosure the fuse on the faulty board was working properly when I started out but Failing to heed my own warning, I touched two points on the board with my multimeter and caused the fuse to blow. The benefit of that mistake is now I can show you that a good fuse will have continuity across it when testing it on your meter, and a blown fuse won't. So check your fuse and make sure it's still working properly. It could be as simple as that, and hopefully it is. But even when I replace the fuse with a working one, the board is still dead, so the search continues. The Next step for me is to check the capacitors. This is an old power supply, over 20 years old, and 
While most components don't typically fail for just no reason, capacitors like to do just that. The capacitors, especially um, these round electrolytic capacitors, can fail for any number of reasons. Luckily, a lot of times these will show their faults by either bulging at the top or maybe even leaking at the top. Uh, they've actually been designed that way. You can see these cross marks at the top to allow the fluid inside to expand. This helps prevent the fluid inside from leaking out and getting all over the circuit board because that stuff is very corrosive and will damage the board even more. You can see here what a bad capacitor can look like. So if any on your board are bulging or leaking either out of the top or the bottom, you should expect to have to replace them. Uh, unfortunately, none of the capacitors on this board are showing any clear signs that they're defective. That doesn't mean one's not, it just means our job's a little harder. There are ways of testing capacitors. You can use a multimeter that's capable of testing the capacity rating, but for that you have to remove the capacitor from the circuit. Another option is to use an ESR meter, and that can help with diagnosing capacitors while still in circuit, so you don't have to go through and desolder each one. But I don't have an ESR meter, so I'm kind of forced to go about it the hard way of desoldering each piece. Now, I am admittedly lucky in that I have a reference working device, so I have the luxury of simply swapping components to test them out. I did try and take readings from the boards to see if anything popped out as faulty, but there were no apparent shorts to ground, none of the capacitors were damaged, none of the other components showed any signs of damage, um, like burn marks. So I had no great place to start but I did find that this big capacitor was giving me some strange readings on the faulty board, and so I decided to start with that. I figured there's only about 50 components on this board as it is, and I knew power was at least getting to this big capacitor, so the circuit was probably good up to here, and it was something beyond that causing the issue. And to be honest, removing these big through-hole components is a lot easier than trying to micro-solder. The legs are big and distinct, and there's little chance of creating bridges if you know a little about what you're doing and have some of the proper tools on hand. I like to use this copper wire braid to soak up the solder, adding a little bit of flux just helps entice the solder to wick away. And please do remember to set up some good ventilation if you're going to be soldering a lot. First off, it just kind of smells bad, and on top of that, it's not great for your lungs to breathe in the fumes. But once the solder is removed, you can pull the component out like so and do the same for the other capacitor. Remember that these electrolytic capacitors have a polarity to them, so you want to be sure you're inserting them into the circuit correctly. Otherwise, they can explode, which is very bad. And now with the capacitor swapped, I can test out the bad board and see that it still doesn't work. Um, again, I'm lucky in that I have a good board to compare with, so I can just put the capacitor from the faulty board into the good one and see if it works because, you know, to be honest, there could be more than one issue with the faulty board. But if the good board still works with the faulty board's components, then I can conclude that the component from the faulty board is good. With it installed, we see that the good board does indeed still work, so that big capacitor was not the problem. Which begs the question which component is? To be honest, I was a bit at a loss of what to do. I didn't really want to go through and replace piece after piece after piece, but I couldn't find any faults. I traced the power coming through and it was making to the big capacitor, and after that it started getting a bit weird, which looking back now I realize I was on the right path, I just couldn't see it because I didn't have a schematic of the board yet, so I was trying to figure out the traces and paths, and that's not always easy. After testing the board some more, and I don't really recommend testing it like this with the power coming through, it just increases your chances of crossing leads that shouldn't be crossed and creating a real hazard. But I wanted to follow the path of power to see if I could figure out how far into the circuit it was getting, and what I found was that this chip was also acting funny. On the good board it was showing a decent voltage, around 35 volts on one side and the desired 12 volts on the other, while on the faulty board it only had voltage on the one side, it did not have the 12 volts needed on the other. So yeah, I swapped those chips, just like the capacitor, and it didn't solve the problem. The chip was fine. It was something else in the circuit. By now I figure I should just take the plunge and replace the other electrolytic capacitors as I knew they were a likely cause even though they weren't showing any faults. I started on this side and removed each one and replaced it with the good board while placing the removed capacitor on the bad board. 
In each case, the bad board didn't work and the good board still did. That is, until I got to this capacitor. This one I replaced and the bad board miraculously worked. And when I attached it to the good board, it showed zero output volts. So I had found the bad component though through a very tedious trial and error method and what I'm not sure would work for more complex circuits. So you can see that this particular capacitor hadn't failed catastrophically or anything, it simply failed. Whether it was just a leaky capacitor on the inside or just couldn't hold a proper charge anymore, it was enough to disrupt the circuit and prevent it from operating as intended. Now I did manage to find a schematic for this power supply or one very similar to it actually. It didn't come up on any normal searches for PS2 power supply schematics and only popped up randomly when searching for a part number. My next step after replacing the capacitors would have been to look at the MOSFET on the board and searching for that part number actually brought up the site repairedthats.com. They didn't have an exact schematic for my board but this one is very close and they do have others so check them out to see if perhaps they have a schematic for your board. I'll leave a link to the site down below. And if I look here, you can see that this, this is a big capacitor. It's listed as 400 volts here, while the one on my board is actually 220 volts, but everything else is very similar. If we remember, this one was giving us a weird reading, and if we trace this line here, we see that it eventually gets to the transformer, and from there it goes to the output, but it also connects to that other chip that I removed, which also gave us a weird reading. Now the other side of the capacitor makes its way right to that faulty capacitor, which is right here. The faulty capacitor likely disrupted this chip, possibly preventing it from switching on or something, who knows, besides an electrical engineer and I'm a mechanical engineer. But I wasn't done. I wanted to see if I could get the now non-working power supply to work. All I needed to do was replace the bad capacitor with a good one. I had another power supply lying around, it's a different design with different components, but it did have a capacitor that I could use. Capacitors are somewhat interchangeable. If you can, you want to get one with the same uh, farad rating and same voltage as well as temperature. Um, then it's effectively the same capacitor. But in a pinch, you can use one that's slightly different. It's important that the temperature ratings are the same and that the capacitor you're using has at least the same voltage rating as the one being replaced. You should never use one with a lower rating because it could overload the capacitor and cause it to blow. As for the capacitance rating, it should be pretty close in rating. In my case, I was replacing one with a 27 microfarad rating with one rated 33 microfarads. I removed that one and installed it on the now bad board and to a little bit of amazement, it worked. I was pleasantly surprised. So now I have two working power supplies. Well, technically speaking, I had two working power supplies before, but you know what I mean. In the end, I decided to take the mismatched capacitor off and replace it on its original board. Eventually, I'll go back and find a proper capacitor to replace here that's the same capacitance and voltage. Or I'll just save this power supply as a parts board for um, any power supplies I find in the future that have components needing to be replaced. I thank you for watching. I, I hope you got something useful out of this video. Perhaps you'll take it upon yourself to try and diagnose very carefully what's wrong with your power supply, and also maybe that it's not always clear what the problem is. A faulty component can disrupt several others in the circuit without being obviously damaged, and that can make it a real challenge to track down the source, turning it into a bit of a rabbit hole scenario. If you enjoyed this video, please uh, consider liking and subscribing to the channel, um, and if anyone has any thoughts on how best to track down a leaky capacitor like this, please leave a comment down below because I'm always trying to learn. Thank you.